Now let's talk about bias mitigation during the post-processing stage, meaning at this point we already have model predictions and we want to modify those predictions. So we actually want to change some of the results. So how can we go about that? The goal, as I just said, is to mitigate bias by making modifications to the predicted labels or scores after the model has been trained. And this is actually quite a common scenario where you might not be the main owner of the model, but you can measure the fairness of the outcomes. So you can then take a fairness intervention and modify the outcomes according to one of the fairness criteria that we already had a look at. And now there are going to be multiple options of how you can actually go about modifying the results. The first option here would be a manual update. So this would be referring to a scenario where there's a human in the loop and the model makes suggestions, we can call them, and then there's a final verification step by a human who may either agree or disagree with the model predictions. And then the final output will be coming from a combination of the human reviewer and the model suggestion. Another idea of how we could intervene is through algorithmic modifications. So we can change predictions to achieve parity of certain metrics. And we can do that by modifying, for example, the thresholds for different groups. And as I said, this is required when there's no direct access to the model given or the retraining of the model is practically not feasible. So if we think about big foundational models, those can take several months on very large compute instances and we cannot simply retrain those models on a frequent basis. To get a bit more practical about how we can actually modify the results algorithmically, well, number one step is we want to generate a score for each data point. So that could be a probability score or a continuous numerical value in the case of regression. And then we want to choose, and this is now in the example of classification, a threshold for each group or each subpopulation that we have in the data set, such that everyone in a particular group who scores above this threshold that we set receives a positive decision. And now assuming that positive decision also is really the good outcome. And this is not just referring to yes or no. So what that then means is that the choice of threshold will allow to optimize for different fairness measures. So for example, we will have a look at equal opportunity and we also already know about demographic parity. However, there's a bit of a caveat to this where using different thresholds for different groups actually constitutes disparate treatment in the United States because we're actually explicitly treating different groups differently. So again, this might not be a method that can be deployed depending on the domain that you're using your model for. Moving on to the example of calibration curves, and those technically meet or fall under the criteria of sufficiency. And we're going to use a classification example where we consider the probability scores. So the output of a probabilistic classifier is the confidence of belonging to a certain class. So let's say we have class one and a predicted probability value. So this is now we actually need to have access to the score itself of 0.51. Well, that would mean we're actually not very confident that this particular data point should have received class one. Keep in mind now, we had a look at logistic regression. The scores range from zero to one and we usually use a threshold at 0.5. So this particular data point with 0.51 is just barely above the threshold, and that means we're actually not very confident. If the score had been a few decimal points lower, well, then the class label would have actually flipped. If, on the other hand, we have a data point with predicted probability of 0.95, well, it's very close to one and well above the threshold of 0.5, and we can say we're indeed very confident that this data point was classified correctly. So, a probabilistic model then is calibrated when the mean predicted probability for samples or data points binned based on their probabilities 
closely match the true proportion of outcomes per bin. So practically what this means for a calibrated classifier is that true positives and false positive rates will have a linear relationship. And we're going to break down the statement that I made just a moment ago in the next few slides. Once again, we have our university admission example with one protected or sensitive attribute and a score, a numerical feature, and then the outcome, which is admission positive or negative. And assuming now that we've trained a model, and the model is now producing predicted probabilities for each row of our example data set, and we see they're already ranked in some sense, where the first data point received a predicted probability of 0.2, second data point of 0.25, third data point 0.35, and so forth. And then we know that if we apply the decision boundary or the threshold of 0.5, well then the predicted label, the actual output that would be provided to, in this case, the student or applicant would be zero or one, accepted or denied. So coming back to our statement from just a moment ago, we said we want to bin the predicted probability values and we want to look at the mean per bin. So that's what we're doing in the next couple of columns. First, we're going to generate bins and the bin range here is chosen to be 0.9. So there's going to be the first bin ranging from 0.2 to 0.29, which means the first two data points actually belong to that particular bucket. The mean predicted probability now for this particular data bin is going to be 0.225, so just the average between the two data points. And it so happens that in our artificial example here, we only ever have two data points per bin. And now we need to compare the mean predicted probability per bin to the true fraction of positives. So now we're going to refer back to the true labels, the actual outcomes, and we have those in the third column, the admission column, and we can compute what the true fraction of positives was. So in the first example here, the first bin, we had one denied and one approved outcome. So the true fraction then becomes 0.5. And in the final step now, we want to adjust our predicted labels, our predicted outcomes, such that the mean predicted probability matches the true fraction of positives more closely. We're now going to take it one step further. So we've seen how to calculate the mean predicted probabilities per bin and compare it to the true fraction. So what we're going to look at now is the so-called calibration curve and it extends what we've just done by one additional step, which is splitting the predictions based on the sensitive attributes into separate groups. So for a set of people who receive a predicted probability of P, or more generally a score S, we expect P fraction of the members of the set to experience a positive outcome. And we've seen how to calculate those values. The only difference, as I just mentioned, is we also need to split based on the group membership. So we can now check if the pre-fraction actually matches the predicted probability. And now we're going to do this for both groups. And as a visualization here, we have two groups now, male and female. And we can see that in this particular example, the p-fraction values don't actually match for those two groups. So we can now use that calibration curve and that insight to actually adjust our predictions and get those two lines to be closer to one another. Next, I want to talk about equality of odds, which falls under the separation criteria. So what does equality of odds do? Well, very simply, it aims to equalize the misclassification rates across different groups. So that means we're equalizing the true positives and or also the false positive rates. And we've seen this equation already. So for equalized odds, both true positive rate and also the false positive rate have to be equal for the groups that we have in our data set. And we have here the expression using the conditional probability notation where the predicted outcome here as y hat equals one, given that the individual belongs to a certain group 
and they either have a positive or negative grand truth value should be the same as the probability of receiving a positive outcome when the individual does not belong to a group and again for y equals 0 and 1. As it turns out it's actually quite hard to equalize both the true positive rate and the false positive rate so basically finding the point at which for both groups TPR and FPR are equal is going to be very hard. So what we want to do is we want to relax this a little bit by saying we're only going to focus on the case where y is 1. And this is now equality of opportunity. So the relaxation of equality of odds only considers the true positive rate and this leads us to equality of opportunity. So it's a less strict notion of fairness here that we're going to use and that can actually be achieved more easily in practice. Coming back to equality of opportunity for a second, we have here the so-called receiver operator curve with the true positive rate on the y-axis and the false positive rate on the x-axis and two groups here A and B. And what we can see here is that there is a certain area where both of these overlap and there's also going to be an area where the true positive rate or the false positive rate of one group exceeds the one of the other group. So why are we looking at this chart? Well it actually helps us define the region of which or the points of which we can choose from to find a model solution that equalizes both the true positive and false positive rates for the different groups. In fact we have the region shaded here right now where we can see a diagonal line from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And we would only ever consider points that are above the diagonal because any point below the diagonal is actually worse than random guessing and should not be the output of a reasonable classifier. And we can also see that there's the intersection of group A and B that remains. So this is the feasible solution space and we can find one of the equalized rates in that shaded area. We're going to have a look at this in the notebook right now on equalized odds. So this notebook will show us how to post-process our data using the equalized odds criteria. So we're going to create some model predictions and then we're going to modify them after the fact and see how that changes our outputs. And once again, just as we talked about limitations, pre-processing and in training, we also need to say a couple of things about limitations that apply to post-processing techniques. And again, one of the points I already mentioned, whereby if we apply a threshold that differs per group, that might actually constitute disparate treatment. And on the other hand, some of the methods that will actually modify the results they rely on randomness and it's not always clear whether or not randomly exchanging the predictions is justifiable across the different domains. So we really need to think carefully what does it mean to flip one output from let's say positive to negative or negative to positive because there are different costs associated to getting these things wrong. Another challenge is that we might not have access to the sensitive attributes at this point in the model prediction stage and even just having access to the probability scores might be challenging. In most of the cases where you would only get the output ones or zeros or the different classes or different scores but not necessarily the underlying probabilities and a lot of the methods do actually rely on having access to those scores directly.